Hello again. I'm Chris Lee of Southeastern 14. We're here to talk LSU. Mostly football, might get into some baseball. Joining us when we talk LSU, our friend Matt Moscona. He's from ESPN Radio, Baton Rouge, numerous other destinations. Too many, too many to list. If, if you live in that state, you know Matt Moscona. He is great at what he does. He's a wonderful human being. Matt, Matt, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to join you us. You got me today. tearing up. <laughs> my eyes are watering a little bit i promise i wasn't tearing up just by the nice things you were saying it's great to be with you chris thanks as always for the invite man it's because baseball season's around the corner right that, that's really it <laughs> it gets us all emotional right uh, especially if the, if the tigers end up with a dog pile in omaha again yeah well uh before we get started reminder our video brought to you by our friends at bet online it's playoff time the usual suspects are heading to vegas for the championship our partner, Bet Online, is your number one source for football odds, stats, trends, and lines with everything from point spreads to hundreds of bets on everything from the coin toss to the color of Gatorade. Bet Online is your number one source for your championship wagering. Head to Bet Online, join today, get in on all the action. Bet Online, the game starts here. Before we look forward to LSU football, what it's going to look like next year and beyond, interesting season in Baton Rouge. I, I guess, I don't know if this is fair, it, it feels like LSU is one of those programs that if you're not in the hunt for a national title or at least in the playoff, the, the season's been a failure. But on the other hand, um, I always say if, if you can't hit expectations, at least be fun. And boy, were they fun to watch. You had a Heisman winner. You had an offense that that, that put up points every three minutes, it felt like. And it gave some up, too, which yeah. is why LSU was in the playoff. But how did fans, when everything was said and done, process what happened last year, Matt? Yeah, I think um, I think it, it, exactly what you said. I think they will celebrate the individual season that Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas, that, that they put up, uh, and will always sort of um, lament what could have been because – with the offense the way that LSU's was, I mean, literally, they led the country in total and scoring offense. You just needed to be competent defensively. You just needed to be good. Not great, not elite. You just needed to be good enough. And instead, they were historically bad. So I think everyone will forever celebrate Jaden's Heisman. Keep in mind, before Joe Burrow, uh, there were a lot of LSU fans who would tell you the one thing that they never got to see was an LSU player win the Heisman because uh, Billy Cannon did it in 1959. You know, it was, 40, it was, I mean, 60 years from 59 to 2019. Uh, so wow. a lot of LSU fans came and went and never saw an LSU player win the Heisman. Um, so it's rare around here, and people celebrate it. Um, that's probably why you saw so many LSU fans stumping so hard on social media for, for Jaden to win it when it looked like, you know, Knicks or Penix might, might uh, snag it, but um, they'll honor Jaden forever and celebrate it. And it was amazing to watch, but yeah, but they'll lament the fact that that's a season of a team that could have, could have, and probably should have been a playoff team. Which leads me to where I was going next. When it goes so poorly on defense, with that talent and, and maybe it wasn't the level of talent that that LSU held on the other side of the ball but it was a lot of talent I mean you got Harold Perkins and defensive linemen who can play and defensive backfield was a weakness that that undid it but how do you process what we saw how big of an underachievement was it and now Brian Kelly's kind of clean house on that side of yeah. the ball because for whatever reason it just wasn't good enough so to be very clear, I, I, there is kind of a misconception that like LSU will always have talent, and to some degree that's true. But this was a defense that was really void of talent. Um, Her you mentioned Harold Perkins, who they could never quite figure out the best, which is so weird considering how dynamic he was as a freshman, and they couldn't figure out how to use him uh, this past season. Um, but man, you, I don't know that you had an NFL draft pick anywhere else on the defense. Hmm. I mean, we might see Mason Smith and and I think Makai Wingo will get drafted, but he was injured and, and missed the end of the season. But aside from that, I, there was nobody at linebacker or in that secondary that's a draftable prospect, which is wow. really weird for LSU. So they missed a bunch in the portal. 
And the players they did have, Matt House and his staff just didn't do nearly a good enough job of maximizing the talent they did have. And that's why Matt House got fired and they let go basically the entire defensive staff um, and have rebuilt that side of the ball. Because you, you just, you can't, Chris, you can't be at a place like LSU where you have the resources you do. Yeah. The the fertile recruiting ground in Louisiana, the the facilities, the championship pedigree, that everything you want and need, you can't have those resources and literally be the worst defense in program history. You just can't. It's it's never going to be acceptable, nor should it be. So, you know, Brian Kelly had to go and and uproot the whole thing. And um and he replaced his entire defensive staff, and I think they they did a, a really smart thing the way they went about doing it, which we could talk about. But, you know, they got to upgrade the town. I mean, look, when when your talent's bad and your coaching's bad, that's not a great recipe to have success, and that was LSU's defense in, in 2023. It, it's just hard to fathom everything you just told me because you got LSU – I don't know. I don't know who claims the right to defensive back university. Um, probably depending on the draft, could be Alabama, could be LSU. But I mean, we're splitting hairs. It's it's a Miss Universe pageant of yeah. defensive Ohio secondaries. State, with Florida jump into yeah. it as well. Always. Yeah. What is LSU's right in there with any of them? Right with the corners and safeties. In the when you look at the number of draft picks, the number of national award winners. I mean, LSU is is the pace, has been the pace setter for two decades. Yeah. Not not to mention defensive linemen. And, and you got it, you got a coach in Brian Kelly whose defenses have been really good. At, how do you explain that? Well, they definitely missed in the portal on a couple of guys. So keep in mind what Brian Kelly inherited. When Ed Ogeron was out the door, LSU had I think they played that bowl game against Kansas State with like 39 scholarship players. So you had a mass exodus of talent. Brian Kelly came in his first year, went double-digit players out of the portal, and they hit on a lot of those guys. Uh, Jark Bernard Converse, Makai Gardner. I'm not telling you these guys were all America caliber players, but all of them made NFL rosters as rookies. Um, and then all of those guys, they were, they were one-year mercenaries. And so they had to go back into the portal last year, and they just missed on everybody. You know, They signed Denver Harris, who was a five-star coming out of high school, and he couldn't play. They signed Deuce Chestnut, who... You know, was on some all ACC teams. Was a freshman All America at Syracuse. Kid couldn't play at this level. Wow. Um, they, you know, they their best cornerback was Zai Alexander, who was a transfer from FCS Southeastern Louisiana. You know, they went and got a linebacker out of uh, out of Oregon State, Omar Spates, who was all Pac twelve and came here and couldn't play. So. You know they they missed on a bunch of guys and they didn't develop guys and maximize their talent. So it's it's a it's a layered answer to the question of what happened. But basically, they missed on a bunch of guys in the portal, and they didn't coach up the guys they had. Is it more nuanced than that? Because you you just mentioned guys, and I researched these guys before the season. Like you know, Deuce Chestnut had done some stuff at Syracuse, and you know all, all, a lot of those guys had some accomplishments. I think Alexander had been a had he been an FCS All American? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's not like these guys hadn't done things other places. So I, I don't know if it was. I mean, you're closer to it than I was. It was. I mean, and, and look, coaches got fired in the aftermath, which has got to be part of of your answer. But I, I'm just still perplexed that it didn't work better. Well, I mean, I we could go nuance. So like Denver Harris, yeah. for example. Denver Harris was a five star. He's an amazing athlete. But Brian Kelly would tell you. All he ever did was play press man. He got off the bus and he was trying to play press man. Well, if you have a guy that it's a great athlete but doesn't understand defense and zone concepts, that's a problem. And he never came along this season. So mm -hmm. that's part his inability, part inability of the coaches to bring him along. Deuce Chestnut, I had a coach tell me, you know, in fall camp, like he can't play for us. Wow. Like they 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 brought him in and he's a a five ten guy that wasn't very fast or athletic. It, it it's a big difference d up receivers at Boston College than it is d up receivers against Ole Miss. <laughs> I mean, it's just and you saw it from the first game when they played Florida State and they had up go up against Keon Coleman and um you know in that squad from Florida State. So 
they they just missed. They missed it misevaluated. And yeah, you know, I think a big part of that was you know, Brian Polian was the was the recruiting coordinator here, and they've misevaluated in the secondary at the high school ranks. They misevaluated in the portal this year. So um I, I think they've gotten it right, Chris. And now if anybody's paying attention to what LSU is doing in recruiting, the next two cycles could be like special, like all time special for LSU um, if they close the way that, that they should, but um, they're going to get it right. I don't know how, how quickly they can get it right in 2024, but 25, 26 and beyond, it should look way more like what LSU should look like. Here's the problem I see though, Matt, and, and like, you, you know, way more about it than I do, but it just occurs to me as we're talking through this, Pl- planning and and saying, I mean, used to be you could say, all right, we got this corner, we're going to have him for for two more years after this one, and you could, you, you're it, the portal. It, it's just left us to snatch and grab, right? You, you're you, you have a hole. Sometimes you have no idea it's coming. One day, bang, you wake up, you're without a starting corner. You got to scramble to get whatever is in the portal, and it may or may not match your system. What what I'm hearing you say a lot of is. These guys could play other places and other systems, but they couldn't play at LSU in its system. That's just a lot to navigate. I think uh, that's why I think roster retention is is as important as anything in college football right now. When you spend the resources to recruit elite guys out of high school, you got to keep them and maximize them, um, which kind of does play, Chris, to one inherent advantage LSU has. And that's I say it all the time. LSU's biggest advantage is the dirt. It's Louisiana. Yeah. Um, this is, and for you know, for people who don't know, Louisiana is a talent-rich state, and LSU is the only Power Five. And, and I think there are only three schools in America that can claim that. It's LSU, Ohio State, and Georgia. With respect to Georgia Tech, but I think we understand like Georgia Tech and Georgia aren't aren't the same. Yeah. Um, they're not recruiting the same kid. So when you're talking about a talent-rich state where you're the only power five and kids grow up in that state wanting to play for the state school, that's what it's like here. You know, Will Campbell was a five-star from Monroe who all he ever wanted to do was play at LSU. So he was never going anywhere else. Well, you got to use that to your advantage. And, you know, I think Brian Kelly, when he took this job, Chris, I think he – because Kelly at Notre Dame had recruited Louisiana. He got Logan Diggs, a running back out of New Orleans – um, he got Jerry Tillery, uh, a lineman out of Shreveport, up to Notre Dame. So he recruited this state. And so he knew there was talent here. I don't think he, when he got the job, the way I kind of describe it, it's like he waded into the water about waist high. Yeah, he built a staff where it was like half the staff was guys that knew the state and the Southeast and the culture, and half the staff were guys that knew him. And the big problem they had was, you know, Brian Polian was his recruiting coordinator. And Brian Polian didn't have any connectivity to this state or the culture or the people or the region or any of it. So, you know, the 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 most glaring example I give all the time is, you know, they recruited and signed a kid, a, a cornerback out of Las Vegas, Bishop Gorman named Jeremiah mm-hmm. Hughes. And Jeremiah Hughes is a three-star. Chris, you don't get on a plane and fly out of Louisiana to recruit a three-star cornerback. You get in your mm-hmm. car and you go five minutes from campus to Catholic High, or to or, or on your campus to U High, or and you're recruiting four stars. Like throw a rock and hit a three star in Louisiana, man. It's just they're everywhere. And so what Brian Kelly did with this staff is he has cannonballed into the deep end. Uh, he brought back Corey Raymond, who played at LSU and for ten years was was the godfather of DBU. He's the guy that built all those great defensive back rooms. They went and got Bo Davis, who played at LSU and coached defensive line at LSU. They, they paid him a million and a half, but they got him away from Texas. Um, they brought Blake Baker back to be the defensive coordinator. Um, at literally every single staff member they added, all of them, either played at LSU, coached at LSU, or have coached in the state of Louisiana. You look at LSU staff, literally ev- all 10 of LSU staff members now either played at LSU or from Louisiana, have coached college football in Louisiana, because the only way you maximize this state 
is by you squeeze every drop of juice out of that orange, man. Yeah. It like you Nick Saban showed the way back in 2003. You know, that class he built that won that, o- cha- that championship in 03. Marcus Spears, mm-hmm. Michael Clayton, Marquise Hill, Andrew Whitworth, all dudes from Louisiana that Nick got to stay home. And, you know, I, I, I look at, you know, the look at the at the most recent championship. Your Burrow was the exception, but man, Jamar Chase from New Orleans, Justin Jefferson from New Orleans, Derek Stingley from Baton Rouge, Clyde Edwards Elair from Baton Rouge. Look up and down that roster, man. Yeah. All these dudes that were first round draft picks and all Americans, they're all from here from within you know, yeah. 60 miles of campus. <laughs> like you have Patrick Queen played at Livonia. I mean, it's 10 minutes from LSU's campus. Like you you just gotta maximize this state, man. And if you do it, you can win national championships and be dominant doing it. But you can't get on a plane and fly to Vegas to sign a three star cornerback, man. Like it's that's not yeah. that's not the path here. Um, and I think it took two years for Brian Kelly to fully embrace that, but he's fully embraced it, man. And you know, they got the number one class in the country right now for 2025, and they keep building on it. And I don't know if you've looked ahead, Chris, but you know, three of the top players in America, any position, three of the top five are from Louisiana for 26. Wow. And two of them are from Baton Rouge. One of them preps on LSU's campus at U High, and one's five minutes away at Catholic High. Yeah. So, I mean, the future is very bright if they can maximize this state. And I think that those are the steps Brian Kelly's taken in this offseason of doing that. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but but I'm I'm okay. I'm, let me back off and look at the picture of college football. Like I'll just use Ohio State as an example. Ohio State's a playoff contender until Michigan beats it. We hit bowl season. Quarterback hits the portal, winds up at Syracuse. Everybody's dealing with that. Alabama's dealing with it. Loyalty is thought to be a an old fashioned commodity. It doesn't really play in this day and age of college football. I, I'm what I'm hearing you say is there's an appeal to that state and to LSU that might have some gravity doesn't have anywhere else. Is that fair? Yes. Because retention is not a strategy unless you've got something like that. Yes. But the reality is it's not going to be the case for every player. Look, each of the last two seasons, LSU's recruited a five-star from this state and lost them via the portal. Uh, Walker Howard, who is a legacy. I mean, Walker's dad, Jamie, played quarterback at LSU. Walker's a great kid. All he ever wanted to do was play at LSU. Came here for a year, left and went to Ole Miss. Um, Lance Hurd. Lance Hurd was a five-star offensive lineman from North Louisiana. Signed with LSU. Left this offseason. Took a big NIL deal at Tennessee. So my point is, that's not going to be true for every student athlete. It's not going to be true for every kid in the state. But it is going to be true for enough of them to where if you get them here, you find them and you continue to nurture them and cultivate them. Like Your roster will be fine to where you build through the high school ranks, and supplement through the portal. The last two years, LSU's done it in reverse. Some of it out of necessity because of what Brian Kelly inherited, but they've been taking 15, 20 kids out of the portal. This year, they signed 30 high school kids and single-digit portal transfers, and that's that's the path for Brian Kelly to get it done. I don't know if it's going to net LSU a, a championship or a playoff appearance in 24, but you can look to 25, 26, beyond and go, okay, I see what they're doing. I see the path. Yeah. Staff changes other than the recruiting end of it, you know, and the ties to Louisiana, which obviously will come in handy. Where where do they get better just on the coaching and philosophical end? Everywhere. I mean, God yeah. bless. Like, when when Brian Kelly came in, he brought Kerry Cooks and, and Robert Steeples in to coach the secondary. Kerry Cooks had been with him at Notre Dame. Robert Steeples – was a high school coach who had had one year as a you know, down the line assistant in the NFL. You bring in Corey Raymond, who is you know, as I just mentioned, the guy who who was the godfather at DBU for a decade. Um, Bo Davis on the defensive line is widely considered one of, if not the best, defensive line coach in college football. I mean, you know, he was at LSU. Nick Saban had him at Alabama. Most recently, there at Texas. So. Just technically there as well. Blake Baker is going to coach linebackers. 
Uh, Blake was here in 2021 as the linebackers coach at Ogeron's final season. Um, and, you know, helped develop Damone Clark that year into a guy that, quite honestly, Chris, I, I think should have been the Butkus Award winner, but he was on such a bad team that his sensational season got overshadowed. But um, so much of the most people don't even know he had a great season, but he was otherworldly, Damone Clark, that year. So I, I think Kelly has checked both those boxes or all of the boxes, ties to Louisiana, great recruiters, but also more technically developed and sound coaches as well. I'm looking ahead at that schedule. My goodness. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's it's a little premature to talk talking schedules in, in February, but what, with some of these names, maybe not. I mean, first of all, two former Pac-12 opponents, USC, UCLA. You got right. South Alabama, which is not a pushover. Uh, did lose his head coach to Alabama as a defensive coordinator. You got Ole Miss on the schedule, potential playoff contender, A&M, whatever that looks like, Alabama, Oklahoma. My goodness. Um, what, is, what is a fair expectation with all that? Oh, I think when Vegas puts their win totals out, you'll see LSU somewhere around nine. Um, I think that'll be their over-under, eight and a half, nine, somewhere in there. Um. The look, the undeniable reality about that schedule is just what you rattled off. It is there are a lot of heavy hitters. Um, if you're looking for the positive spin, uh, the way it's structured probably does LSU a favor. So if you if you go through it, they open up on Labor Day or on Labor Day week on that Sunday against Southern Cal, right? So they're gonna play in Vegas against USC. Both LSU and USC are, are almost identical, right, Chris? I mean, both fired their defensive coordinator. The last two Heisman Trophy winners, Caleb Williams, Jane Daniels, gone. So very similar uh, circumstances for those two teams that are going to meet in Vegas. If you manage to win that one, and I don't know if they will, but if you manage to win that one, you come back on a short week to play FCS Nichols, and then you're at South Carolina in week three. Now, South Carolina's replacing... Spencer Rattler and Xavier Leggett and some talent and catching them early, even though it's on the road, catching them early may, may benefit you. Then you come home against UCLA. Now I think I was really hoping Chip Kelly would land an NFL job. Cause if he did, if he did, I think that turnover would have helped LSU tremendously. And they, you know, UCLA would have had a portal window open and they would have lost a ton of players, but even still, if you get through, and then you play South Alabama, as you mentioned. If you get through September, you get an open date the first Saturday of October before you host Ole Miss. And I think that LSU should be a home underdog against Ole Miss, but you get an open date before you got to play them. And then you're home against Arkansas, no KJ Jefferson, right? So yeah. it's a home game against. I'm sorry, that's that's at that's at Arkansas. Forgive me, but no KJ Jefferson. So a little bit of a turnover there. Um. And then you got to go to A and M, so that's your only spot on the schedule there where you go back to back road road games, back to back road conference games. And Arkansas and A and M, your first year, Mike Elko, like that might be. If you could, I mean, if you pick any conference games you have, like that might be the best spot to go back to back, unless if it's Vandy, yeah. which is later in the schedule. Yeah, you get your open date before you play Bama. That's at home, so you get Bama and Ole Miss at home. And then you got to go to Gainesville, which I don't even know if Billy Napier is going to make it to November, quite honestly. Yeah. And then you're home against Vandy and home against Oklahoma. And I think Oklahoma has some real questions they have to answer. So on its face, look, that's a brutal schedule. I get it. Um, and I'm I'm not naive. But if you if you were to shape that schedule in the best way possible, I'm not sure it could have laid out any better. But the key for LSU is to get through September undefeated and have that open date before you play Ole Miss, and that's really when you find out what you're going to be. Matt, I think it's funny how the playoff changes the conversation because I think you go 9-3 and three with that schedule, you're one of the 12. Um, I think it's how – it's definitely possible. I think it's how the 9-3 and three looks. If you lose at yeah. home to Ole Miss, at home to Bama, at home to Oklahoma – then I don't know that you lose three home games and and especially yeah. two of them in November and you're I, I don't know how you make it there. Um, if you stub your toe in the opener in Vegas against SC, 
but you rally and let's say maybe you lose to let's say maybe you lose to Ole Miss at home, but you beat Bama and Oklahoma at home, but you fall somewhere on the road in conference play. Maybe. Um, but the thing about LSU, Chris, is like is their toughest games are at home this year. So, you know, when you look at the games that are really ones that you might see LSU dropping, it's hard to imagine it being three road games. Um, maybe the neutral side game against SC, but you know, SC, Bama, Ole Miss, that's that's tough to overcome, man, because you start to look at, all right, well, where's the marquee win? I mean, unless if Florida ends up being way better or Oklahoma been, ends up being a contender this year, um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that with this schedule, the, again, it's it's how the 9-3 and three would have to look uh, for them to, to think about being a playoff team. But you know, I think a best-case scenario for this team is you know, maybe you drop drop the home game to Ole Miss and you stub your toe somewhere else, but you have marquee wins, maybe Bama, Oklahoma, you know, you're 10 and two. I think that's probably a best case uh, for, for this team as of now. I mean, look, we know there's going to be another portal window. uh, And I think LSU still needs to add defensive linemen. And there's the unknown of what does it look like with Garrett Nussmeyer running the show for the first time. He's a veteran guy. He's a fourth year guy, but it'll be, you know, your starter for the first time. So LSU is interesting, man, because, They'll have talent. Um, they'll have expectation. They got a hell of a schedule. But they also got a lot of questions against a really tough schedule. It makes it hard to to really forecast them as a contender. Matt, we covered a lot of ground with LSU. Any any big storylines or things out there with LSU football that we didn't get to that are worth a mention? I just, they've got to add defensive tackles in the portal. Um, they're they they need bodies, Chris. I mean, they were hoping to get Makai Wingo and Mason Smith back and both decided to go pro. Their best interior player was Jordan Jefferson. He's out of eligibility. So, I mean, they're going to get Dominic McKinley, who's a five-star number one player in Louisiana. He's going to sign on Wednesday in the in the February signing period. And, um, you know, you got Jalen Lee, who's a local kid who went to Florida and transferred home. I mean, Jacoby and Guillory's coming back for a fifth season, but he's kind of been a rotational piece throughout his career. Like, you need bodies. Like, they they have got to go and get bodies on the interior defensive line of the portal in that spring cycle because they just – they they don't have enough bodies. Uh, they're, they're rotational guys who are the young guys waiting their turn. Well, all, Ty G. Hill, Fitzgerald West, not names that, that any fan should know, but guys that they had recruited were waiting their turn. They all left this offseason in the portal. So your depth has been diminished, and your top three guys are all off to the NFL draft. So they're in a bad, bad way on defensive line. They, I mean, they got to go add defensive linemen. I mean, that is, you know, if you look at it as, all right, you have wants and needs and musts, whatever's ahead of a must, that's defensive tackle for LSU right now.